Crown TV show. But alongside that, they've been working with a Chilean theatre group called Los Inseparables on a uh, presentation called I Am Tony TV. Um, and this collaborative international multimedia project um, and it will be live on Tuesday and again uh, will involve discussion with the cast members to talk about how they made it, how they worked during lockdown um, and, and of course not only working with um, an organisation in, in a country really quite far away, uh, Chile in South America, um, but also an organisation where they have, a, you know, they, they use a different language um, to us. Uh, they speak Spanish and remain in Chile, am I right there? I believe so. Yeah. Um, there may also be Portuguese speakers and other indigenous languages, of course. Um, but uh, I just think it's going to be fabulous. And I, we have had the uh, pleasure and, and luck of seeing some of the little bits of work that have been uh, yeah, work in progress, as it were. And that's absolutely fantastic. And it? it looks really, really cool. Uh, then next Thursday, we have the Pop Up Poetry Cafe. So those of you are, who are longstanding members of uh, together and the, the, the community that works in and around with together you'll know that the pop-up pop poetry cafe is something one of the one of the staple um activities that together have done and have been doing right since the beginning um and obviously during lockdown that originally had proved really difficult because people weren't able to get together however uh due to some marvellous inventive thinking um, together have been able to uh, commission a phone system that allows uh, our, uh, our um, involvement, where are our colleagues? Noel, we'll just go with Noel, engagement worker, that's it, sorry there, <laughs> lost, uh, lost, my, lost my words for a moment. So Noel, our engagement worker, um, uh, runs this system which allows us to contact a whole host of people all at the same time um, via a telephone system. And then everybody brings a poem and takes turns at reading a poem out. Um, then they discuss a topic um, and what that means to them. And then there'll be a break when everyone goes away and writes a poem. Um, and comes back half an hour or so later in, into the group um, and read each other what they've done if they want to. You know, there is no, you've got to do this at all. It's very much about if you're feeling in the right place to be creating poetry um, or, and other forms of spoken word that go with the topic at hand, and that's great. And then quite often on the afternoon show of the Wednesday. So that pop up poetry club. Um, done in a, is on a Wednesday morning and then poems are read out on the Wednesday afternoon and again uh, we have the pleasure of um, reading out some of those poems as it's not really um, quite uh, feasible for everyone to read their own poems although that's something we would love to move more towards and would always encourage those that are comfortable to read their own poetry to come on the show and do it. Uh, following that we have on Saturday the 28th of November, Sahira Khan, The Cockerel and the Fox. Um, this is uh, a new piece of work from actor, poet and TV presenter Sahira Khan. Um, it is a performance piece. Again, once the performance is over, she'll be answering, answering questions from the audience. Um, and this piece of work, because Sahira is um, an artist who is a deaf person, she performs in BSL and then the interpretation will be a voiceover of the BSL. Following that on the Tuesday, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we have the World AIDS Day commemorative pieces. Um, um, both plays which were unable to tour in 2020 
So we are bringing you live recordings of the premieres of those sh shows which were recorded in 2019. Then on Wednesday, the 2nd of December, uh, so if you remember right at the beginning earlier, and for those of you who've joined a bit later, I remember we were talking about Jess Starnes walks. Um, and uh, these are, these will be a series of filmed excursions that have been carried out over Google through Google Maps and Google Streets and well, Google Street View and um, having, uh, spoken with Jess on the show last week. I'm kind of mightily impressed that she can navigate a tour of somewhere uh, via these uh, these pieces of software, um, whereas I normally just end up spinning on the spot somewhere and walking into a bush, or metaphorically walking into a bush, obviously. Um, and those show those films are going to be ready um, and released on Wednesday, and then Thursday the um, 3rd of December through to Sunday the 6th of December um, sees the Together 2020 Disability Film Festival. December the 3rd is of course the, Euro the International Day of Disabled People um, and so it's a very apt day to launch the festival um, and this will uh, also include a specific celebration of Justin Edgar's reasonable adjustment exhibition on that day. Um, Dr. Drew Gosling will again be in conversation, this time with Justin Edgar, um, who is uh, probably one of the most prominent um, filmmakers who identifies himself as a disabled person. Um, and uh, Justin has been making some fabulous films and is now very much involved in um, supporting other people to make films as well um, as part of one of the commissioning bodies for new films. We will then, uh, so that, the, 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 fest, the film festival, um, of which you can find much more detail of uh, within the broader festival um, listings on our web pages, um, as I say, runs from Thursday the 3rd through to the Sunday the 6th. Um, some of these presentations um, are hosted and some will be um, just click in and watch. Then we have two final events to talk to you about. One will be Tuesday the 8th of December. It's called Indus, the sound of the story. And I'll read this to you. It says, whether it's on film or live, the visuals are only half the story. The sound is vital for people who are blind or visually impaired. In this practical session, Ruth Mariner and Gestalt Arts present their ongoing work with opera and explore how live Foley sound effects and audio description can heighten the experience for everyone. Now, I hear you going, Foley sound? What's Foley sound? Uh, it is effectively, it's the, uh, when, when, you, when, when you hear all the background sound effects that go on, like doors closing, leaves rustling, um, wind blowing, waves crashing, cats meowing, um, uh, babies crying, um, doors, you know, car engines running and stuff like that. They're, they're all put in just to create the depth of sound. Because otherwise it'd be a bit like me now where I am, I'm just talking with, with uh, kind of no other background noises going on. And, and I'm sure as interesting as I am, it's like, oh, that's just that man talking. Um, whereas what you want when you're being immersed in a play or a film is that the sound creates part of the um, scene that your mind is picturing for you, particularly if you're blind or visually impaired. But even for those of us who aren't, you know, if you suddenly watch a film and there's no background sound, it's really, really strange because your mind expects it to be there. And, and uh, that understanding of the, the, the mind's need for those sounds comes from just Gestalt psychology and uh, why Gestalt arts is so much involved in it. And then to close the end of it, um, the, the festival 
we have our end of festival party, uh, which is Thursday the 10th of December at 7 p.m. This is our annual open mic musical performance and poetry event and will include the Arts Award presentations and the celebration of the release of the, of the Together 2020 Poetry Anthology and the 2020 Open Exhibition um, that is taking place online. Um, hopefully, many of you out there will have submitted a piece of poetry for the uh, anthology, and many of us are waiting with uh, excitement to see if we've been lucky enough to have been included in the anthology, um, which is fabulous, which would be awesome for everyone who is, and they also get a free copy of it, um, which is cool. Uh, so I'm kind of hoping that I might have made it in there, but I guess, I, 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 who knows? That's me as an artist, not as a director, I must say. That is me as Angry Fish. Uh, <clears throat> just gonna take a breath there. Right, so we've only got five minutes to go now before today's uh, amazing um, live piece is going to take place. So I'm sure uh, those panellists who are going to be joining you on screen um, are warming up their uh, vocals now, getting ready for their presentation. <clears throat> if, if you're watching any of this stuff going on, whether it's listening to me now, looking at the any of the exhibitions um the static ones or the film ones or and or, or of course the live events and you're thinking do you know what i reckon i could do that then you must get in touch with us the ethos um the or another word for that would be um the, the way that together um operates is that we believe that anyone can be an artist. And every artist has to start somewhere. You don't start as a musician being able to play incredible songs. You don't start as an artist drawing um, um, you know, incredible pictures. Um, you don't start as a filmmaker making Star Wars. Um, if anybody does want to get in touch with us, um, our email for anyone interested in taking part in art or finding out more about what we do is info at together2012.org.uk. And I will say that out. That's info, I-N-F-O, at together, T-O-G-E-T-H-E-R, and then 2012 is the numbers, so 2012.org.uk, which is org.uk, just in case it's, uh, I know I, I find struggle myself, sometimes people read out web addresses and you're like, what? And then if you spell it wrong or you put your capital in the wrong place or the dot in the wrong place, it, yeah, you, it doesn't get to where you want it to go. Um, for those of you who do watch the show, um or come in and start want to start watching the show um it is on it as i say it's on the unlock show is on every monday wednesday and friday at three o'clock and it can be viewed either via our website or via youtube um and the web address appears many many times throughout those shows uh, and uh i'll just talk a bit about those shows to finish um they're very fun uh we don't, we're not the BBC, we are Together 2012. That makes us in some ways on equal standing with them because we do it our way and they do it their way. And then I guess just in the way that Blue Peter used to have animals that would appear on stage and um, behave in whatever way they like, we have presenters and pets that also do that. Um, and of course the presenters are always behave, always behave impeccably well. But we do have pets that wander in and out. And, and uh, Dr. Ju is convinced that actually more people are interested in the pets and their appearances 
than they are in what myself, Josh, Julie and you have to say. Um, so if you are interested in the pets, um, again, from you can go into the uh, highlights section from the show and you will find lots of pictures of our pets. Um, there are cats and fish and dogs to name but a few. And of course we have both uh, Precious, who is Julie's dog, and Merlo, who is Stera Plurge's dog. Stera is part of Act Up Newer. Um, and her dog Merlo and both Precious and Merlo uh, take regular turns at going out as doggy camera doggies and uh, bring us films. And on that note, I would like to welcome everybody to the show for tonight and I will see you all soon. Thank you so much, Robin. I can see you're wearing your entire voice out doing this. So I'm just waiting for Ali to pop up on the screen and also Chris, who's our sign language interpreter, welcome Chris and Ali. And if you want to switch yourself off, Robin, you can do that as well. I'm sure you'll be very pleased to have a drink. I hadn't actually thought of us doing it our way, but, um, but Robin is certainly right. If you see my monitor wobble or you see me just suddenly jump, that means one of the cats has just landed on me. The longer we do the Unlocked show and these kind of events, the happier they get. But I'd now like to welcome the international artist, Ali Z. Ali's going to tell us a lot more about herself, but I'm delighted that she's a Canadian artist. When we set ourselves up in 2013, after the success of the Together 2012 Festival, we said we'd prioritize relationships with other people who'd hosted the Olympics and Paralympics. And we've got a long ongoing relationship with different artists in Canada. Ali's really come to us for our Scotland and Australia. Um, so I didn't even know she was Canadian myself until quite recently. But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to take a stroll around the virtual exhibition. We're going to chat as we go and you can join in by live chat. So Ali, tell us a little bit about what we're going to see because I was thinking about this earlier. I've been living with an eating disorder for at least a quarter of a century, but I've never seen it represented in art and I've never seen it discussed in contemporary art. And it was one of the reasons I was so excited to see your proposal for the festival. Yeah, I think um, for myself as someone who has also suffered an eating disorder, it's one of the most prevalent and life-threatening illnesses but in art it's something that most people tend to avoid because it's such a sensitive subject matter and those who have an external experience through secondhand whether family or friends they don't understand the full depth of it where people who live with an eating disorder have often been shunned by the external public because they don't understand it completely so my artwork today tries to give the audience a little bit of an in-depth to understanding and a little bit, hopefully, relatability for those who've had eating disorders between what the mind and the body both experience. Well, I think that was another thing that I really found so powerful about your work because, you know, we'll start looking at it in a minute. But I've never seen work produced by people whose lived experience is having an eating disorder. You know, what we're going to see, I think, uh, in some ways familiar images but they're familiar from a very different perspective they're from familiar from the perspective of the doctor the researcher the journalist but never from the person experiencing the eating disorder has that been your experience absolutely i found that as someone who suffered everyone told me what i should be feeling and how i should be acting according to whether a medical professional or a psychiatric professional or even just like family members is like oh I've had a sibling that's already had it so they've already had their pre-assigned judgments and so then as someone who suffered from it I wasn't allowed to express myself and so then I always as an artist I always found my way to express it was through my art and I wanted to find other artists that try to express it as well but I found that there was a lack of artists that were actively discussing it 
So in my first publication called The Starving Artist, Understanding Eating Disorders Within Contemporary Art, I found 25 international artists that tried to gain a platform to talk about this. And now we're moving into my autoethnographic experience with this exhibition. So you get a little more of my personal story with these works. Great, do you want to introduce the first one? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, if Josh could pull up the um, slideshow, I can absolutely. If you tell me which image you want, I'll uh, I'll pop it up. Uh, we can start with um, Euphoria. While you're doing that, Josh, what I was thinking when you were talking, Ali, is as you were saying, eating disorders are very, very common. And for many people, they're long term, you know, just as with mental illness and phys other physical health conditions, they may be short term, but they may be long term. And yet as a disability arts movement, it's not something that we've really taken on board. So people who are living with an eating disorder but don't have another form of impairment haven't really found a home in the disability arts world and at the same time I don't think there's been enough discussion or opportunities to discuss so this is the series euphoria is it two pieces is it a yeah so um just a quick note on that I found that especially with um eating disorders is that it's normally seen as something to overcome but the reality is, is that different periods in our life will struggle with different relationships with food, whether it be pregnancy, whether it be um, coming of age, a breakup or a relationship where things will trigger and things will set off an eating disorder. And the fact that we can't ever disconnect our relationship with food rather than alcoholics who can cut out alcohol completely. You can't cut out food. If not, you starve to death. So it's an ongoing relationship that every single day you face these challenges, whether it be a 10 out of 10 for severity or some days maybe a four or a six out of 10. But either way, you're still facing this illness every single day, like most other disabilities. And yes, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because that language of war and battle has been so opposed, for example, by people living with cancer, you know, saying, well, this is my body. I'm not fighting my own body. But yes, I mean, that really struck a chord with me. What happens or one of the things that happens with me is I just have no appetite. And then food feels really strange in the mouth, you know, really unpleasant and not something that you could swallow. And that's a response to stress. Well, those things are not controllable. You can try to mediate your response when you're aware of it. But the response is, if you like, because it's so organic, it's an instant response, isn't it? It's very visceral. Exactly. And, and that brings me right into this piece where it's talking a little bit about what's the external perception of it versus the internal perception of it, where someone like yourself just may not have an appetite for food, where for me, sometimes it's just I crave food and I give into like every single ounce of like the flavor and the taste and it kind of ascends you and takes you out of your body so this disconnect between what you're physically feeling in your life and maybe stress and maybe your boss yelling at you but then seeking comfort and refuge in food and this kind of piece is a little satirical in a sense where you kind of get a little more of a playful take on eating disorders but it also enlightens you on the reality that the eating disorder is something that is not all bad but it's something that you kind of want to find the joy in yeah and again it's as you say you can't disengage that comfort eating is something that everybody does comfort eating is something our brains are wired to do quite alarmingly of course so many of the additives in food and as somebody who can't get out to do my own shopping I do kind of depend on food that isn't fresh is very kind of deliberately put there to make you crave more and to boost that kind of brain response but of course that's entirely legal for anybody who can't see clearly the images I think of you in the same white top and um, dark leggings and dark shoes eating directly from the packet but in two different places and in the second one or is it the same is it a representation in two different places or is one a representation of how you're feeling 
So yeah, it's more of a second where it's the same place, but then how your mind perceives the experience and it's trying to show you that it's both physical and internal. Yes, because I thought that, but it also reminded me of the repetition of eating disorders, you know, and at different moments in time and different places, kind of things might be the same. And are these acrylic paintings, oil paintings? I, I do all acrylic. I have a very severe allergy to oil paintings. So it's, yeah, acrylic's my medium of choice. <laughs> Yeah, I thought they were acrylic, but they do, they have a quality that I think makes it difficult to tell. And how big are these pieces? So in real life, they're four by six inches. So I work very small scale because I travel all over the world and I've been doing artist residencies and moving all over the place. But my artwork is so personal to me that I want to bring it with me. And I found that even with the use of a digital exhibition, I can give them life and I can give them more of a presence. So you're actually representing them larger than life in a virtual exhibition. I find that so interesting. And I tell you the artist it reminds me of, and that's Frida Kahlo. It was only when they had the first big Frida Kahlo Tate Modern show that I realized that many of the posters and reproductions you see of her work are bigger than the original pieces and of course it then made sense to me as a disabled woman if you're going to paint in bed if you're going to paint from your wheelchair there's a real limit on the size of your work in the same way as you say if you're traveling it's got to be portable but I love the idea I mean again for people who can't see it you've programmed what's effectively a virtual gallery that you can walk around how does that work for artists who are sitting there thinking wow I'd love to do that I think there's lots of different um, options if you want to go and work online and do a digital exhibition. Of course, there's more than just paintings that I, I'm a painter, so there's lots of different options if you want to do digital renders of sculptures or animations. But in terms of my experience as a painter, I found that digital exhibitions are very easy to navigate once you figure out what you want to do. I recommend you have a plan for what you'd want to like visually draw and plan out and then get to explore and like map it out on um, on the actual exhibition layout. So then just having fun and exploring it is probably the best advice I could give and really challenge what you know physically versus what the possibilities are online because often in COVID and with like budgets and flexibility and finding venues, it's very restricted. So I think definitely explore the creativity that online exhibitions can have. And so what was the software that you used to create this show? Um, it's called Art Steps, which is a relatively new software. Um, I highly recommend it. It's very user friendly and I know that they're still developing more stuff as I go along, but it's a, it's a very flexible program. And if you guys view the exhibition, then you can get a sense of what they offer. Yes. So does this, I mean, does this software art steps, when you're planning the exhibition, do you literally design your own gallery or are there galleries that are sort of templates? There's, there's both. So there's sample galleries and then there's, um, layouts that you can like manipulate so this one was one that really suited my view for the gallery exhibition they have lovely ones by a beach or in a in a nice like wide open space gallery so yeah have fun with it yeah I mean I like the kind of brutalism of what appears to be going around a concrete gallery but it's a lovely idea that instead of being confined by the gallery space you can actually invent the gallery online to suit your show so I I know from your interview on Unlocked with the artist Hazel Brill you also curate did that start when you involved the other 25 artists in the Starving Artist Project or have you been curating for longer? I've been curating for longer I originally started off as a curator and I was doing a visual art and art history degree but I always saw my path was as a curator but I found that 
as an artist, I related so much more to the artists that were being shown. So I was trying to find a way to have the best of both worlds. And I found that curating my own artwork gives the voice that I want as an artist, but also the presentation that I want as a curator. So having that both practical experiences and not misrepresenting and not presenting well, I think is something that I benefit from. And I, I really like being able to be on top of my art and knowing what suits it the best. So shall we move on and see a different set of paintings? Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess Josh, you can just throw up the next one. So tell us about this one, Ali. So this one is called, no matter how many laxatives I take, I still feel like a piece of shit. And part of my language, but it gets right down to the grim reality of what it's like with an eating disorder. I think often stereotypically in the media, it's portrayed as cheerleaders that are working out way too much and having salads and it's a lot more than that it's a lot of despair and it's a lot of heartache and it's hours of torture every single day just to realize that the scale isn't necessarily your friend and I wanted to create a piece of it's a self-portrait and for those who can't see it's two pictures of myself on a toilet and just not trying to how would I describe it it's very contemplative and I remember painting this and trying to be reflective on how I got here and what does the eating disorder mean to me at this point in my life and why do I keep on subjecting myself to the same thing over and over and over again and I think as nice as the last piece was that have a light satirical approach to it it's often not discuss how brutal it can be to endure the same pain over and over again. And, and these are also the works that I really think need to be represented when talking about eating disorders. Yeah, and again, it as you say, it's very contemplative and very powerful. And there's to me, there's something, to me, it's obvious it's a self-portrait and I couldn't necessarily say why, but I think it is the ownership and the point of view that if you see this kind of image, and certainly in the UK, I think documentary makers don't seem to have any boundaries at all, it would be peering through a bathroom door that had been taken off because patients wouldn't be considered to have the right to privacy. And it would just be a very, very different image. But again, I think you're right, there's certain tropes, stereotypes in fiction and of course, that's the other place we see eating disorders, as you say, the kind of the umpteen ones with the, the US gymnast or the cheerleader or the dancer or somebody gets upset. And it's all about one kind of eating disorder. And it's all very, very stereotyped. And it tends to be very short term. <laughs> yeah. You know, and always women, because I think it's really important at this point just to acknowledge that eating disorders are not something that only women experience. I saw some figures recently about the really huge rise in the number of men experiencing eating disorders. So although we're talking about women's experience, you know, we don't mean to exclude anybody, but I'm not sure you could have this image of a man. I'm not quite sure why, but I, I think it is partly because of that stereotype of the person with an eating disorder being a younger woman yeah I absolutely think that as a, a female born female that this has been my experience and I realized that there's a lot of delicate feminine connotations associated with eating disorders but a lot of my research outside of the autoethnographic experience explores the queer and trans and non-binary experience of eating disorders. And it's often used more as a coping mechanism and a way to modify the body because they can't control their gender and they want to feel some sort of comfort within themselves. And I do relate a lot to that, but at the same time, every eating disorder story is different. So 
I think this one captures mine and some of the struggles that I've endured. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I was obviously thinking quite about a lot about this beforehand. And I think one of the reasons that eating disorders are more prevalent in disabled people, but very, very hidden, is that sense of control. It's a bit like not speaking. I have a young person in my life and for many years the social services didn't think she could speak because it was the one thing she could do rather than being judged on the way that she spoke or what she said. It was just easier to be silent. And I think as disabled people, we often only have very kind of slim numbers of coping mechanisms available to us. I've been for about 20 years a co-chair of REGARD, which is the UK's disabled people's organisation for the LGBTQI plus community. And again, one of the things that we often have to point out is that more people are disabled in that community than in the population at large because of the social pressures. And so often it is the kind of addiction issues, eating disorder issues, other kinds of mental health difficulty. Because even by the time somebody's reached the age of 16, if they've experienced so much social rejection and family rejection, again, it's a coping mechanism or it's simply too stressful and your appetite just goes. You know, whether your body thinks that it's under attack and it's better off not eating, I don't know, but all of those things have an impact. And again, it's very very seldom discussed so shall we move on and see another picture yeah absolutely and is there anything in particular you want to see next um i don't know surprise me i'm <laughs> josh I'm the order so far so well, well, oh, now this is the one that I was really hoping Josh would bring up next. So that's fantastic. Tell us about this piece and um, and start with the name, the, the title. Yeah, absolutely. It's called The Value of Lightness. And it's an acrylic painting of a girl. She's wearing a white dress and she's floating in water. And you see a reflection of her floating in the top of the painting for um, those of you who may not have the best visual right now. But it's a very poetic piece, I think, for me. It's exploring the importance of being light and what does that mean in terms of not only eating disorders, but in terms of life. I find that often lightness is associated with like purity and ascending, but in terms of the eating disorder world, being light means letting go, becoming someone else. And I think being light for me has always been about almost like being free from myself. So this painting is a little bit reflective of that and is trying to ascend. But at the same time, you realize you're trapped underwater and you can't swim. And so you can't move and you're very restricted within that. So it's a false feeling of lightness. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful painting and very, very complex. And of course, if you go on to the virtual gallery, you will see it in a better quality than we're able to stream. But one of the things that really strikes me, you know, is the beauty and the aesthetic, which, of course, to me, I think also kind of for me linked back to the push that we have in fashion to an unhealthy body image and you know there's so much written about that elsewhere we won't sort of dwell on it but the reality is that a model's body is an undernourished body you know by definition the body mass index is going to be unnaturally kind of underweight and this is a really beautiful image and yet it's very clear from the reflection at the top that this person is under the water and that you know therefore can't breathe was there something in particular, that, were there different images that inspired you to create it? And the water, you know, is really, really beautiful. Is that a metaphor that you've used before? I honestly haven't. I think this comes from personal experience where whenever I needed to escape somehow, I would go into a pool and I would just start screaming at the top of my lungs because I know nobody would hear me. And the whole entire 
a flexibility in the way you can move your body in a pool is something you can't do on land. And then I just, it hits me every single time I go swimming when you realize that this is just another way that your body is letting you down on land. And so then just kind of felt reflective of the eating disorder experience because no matter how hard you try, you don't win necessarily. But then the whole entire metaphor of water and just body in water is kind of reflective because it's more of a distorted perception. Every time you look in the water, it ripples and it kind of changes constantly, which is the fluctuating of your actual body in real life. So I found that the more I explored water, the more it related to my artist practice. I mean, the technique is absolutely beautiful. When you say you started as a curator, when did you study painting or did you not study painting? I started art in high school we had to take an elective and I was reluctant so I took art and I loved it ever since and I did my undergrad in visual art and art history but then in my career at the time I was pursuing curating and I thought just the visual art undergrad would lead me to curating masters which it did but I found that I never gave up painting and I never gave up art creation. So the whole entire time I was still being an artist. And the more I advanced, the more I want to develop in both of them. So yeah, here I am today. And do you have any, I mean, I know some people want me to ask this. Do you have any favorite paints, favorite manufacturers? Uh, only the ones at Michael's the craft store, just the generic ones. I think just finding what works best for you. I like colors that you can't necessarily make that easily. So I think it's called Artist Craft. I, I like their ones, but again, whatever works best for you guys, because I found what works for me. And how do you start? Do you draw it in paint? Do you do anything in pencil? I'm a very gung-ho person. I have it in my mind and I'm just like ready to go. And so I like, I look up inspiration beforehand, but then I have this like idea in my head and I just have to keep going until it's done. Cause if I stop, then I just, I lose the motion. And so I just have to keep going. So sometimes it's hours at a time. So how long did it take you to complete this piece? about maybe six to ten hours it was something that it, it took a lot of time but it's it's worth it and was it over quite a, well as short a period as you could get to because that's a great description of a process um I think it just it's a blur for me I just lose track of time when I'm doing it so yeah and so, I mean one of the things that I think people have always hated is when disability art is mixed up with art therapy and occupational therapy. But what I find is it can be fine art and it can still be cathartic. Is that, I mean, do you find it cathartic or do you find it actually can be quite troubling in terms of what it brings up? I think it can be both, which is why I like doing it because it's challenging myself and then I'm also learning more about myself. I think that as an artist, I need to express myself and what I'm feeling through my art. And I know that it can be traveling, but then at the same time, I'm uncovering more. And I realize that no matter what it means at the time, I learn more about it afterwards. And then I can question, I can examine at this period of my life, I was feeling this way and I can like grow and evolve from it. And so in terms of art being cathartic, it has an element to that for me, but I think more often than not, it's me trying to question why I feel that way. So it's more trying me to understand myself through my work. So we'll just take the pictures down for a minute so that people can see us larger on the screen, particularly anybody who's watching Chris. Yes, I mean, I think there's a there's always a kind of unsteady path I think between is it cathartic is it upsetting one of the difficulties I often think about funding is you apply for funding and then it's so many months later when you're actually making the project that you're in in a completely different headspace how many how much time does this show represent over months or years is it a retrospective is it a set of paintings that you did quite quickly 
It's been an accumulation. I think it's developed as I've been developing. I've really had the time over the last year, given COVID, to focus and have the meditative space to be reflective on myself and without external stimulus because the world around you is stopped. So you have to focus more within. But it's been in this series, at least the last two years in the making. Yes, and you can tell that. I mean, I'm fascinated still by the fact that on the virtual exhibition, it's larger, you know, literally quite quite a lot larger than life. How how big is the painting we just saw, the likeness? I want to say the likeness of being because that's what it is like, isn't it? The value of likeness, yeah. It's also four by six. All of them I try to keep small, but it's really nice to have that presence because it almost online it makes you feel like you're in the water with her yes absolutely like I say I just I think when I looked at them because they come well I think any image that works works at any size but um but yes I'm still taking away from that one of the things that I think the whole show made me feel too was this stereotype of the starving artist, you know, which is something that you've been able to sort of pick up as a title and everybody understands it, that the uh, the true artist is somebody with no money to the extent that they can't afford to eat. And a true artist will buy paint and buy canvas or buy paper and pens, whatever kind of art form you do before they eat. And I find it such a dangerous stereotype, but I'd never really thought about it until I saw your work is it something yes is it chicken and egg you know at what point did you start thinking about this kind of stereotype and how it impacted on artists I think it came from more of the fact that people told me growing up that as an artist you won't make a living and I found that it kind of just fueled me a little bit. And so I just really was motivated to like make a presence for myself. But at the same time, that same negative voices impacted my self-esteem and my worth. So I found that the whole entire starving artist impacted my health. So I think both the reflection of that and the lived in experience of being told that art and your mental health kind of just accumulated all together and I found that the title was just perfect for it and I think that it's something that is reflective not only of my experience but the large practice of artists that have difficulty of making a living but also trying to combat their disabilities and their struggles within the art world today. Yeah I mean when I really started thinking about it it sets up so many dangerous things doesn't it but that's the first one if you go into the profession thinking that you're going to have to starve you're already in a situation of thinking oh I'm going to be much better off if I can control my appetite oh I'm going to be much better off if I can control what I eat if I can kind of get this cheap diet together and then I can just eat that and I think restricting your diet whether it's by choice or not is always the first step on the path to an eating disorder and again I, I think goodness knows what COVID has done and lockdown is doing at the moment but one of the things that we've realised locally is there's no system to provide hot meals to disabled people who used to get those hot meals at day centres or used to get those hot meals in community cafes as part of their care package. I mean, I've certainly found taking in food deliveries without the support of a social care worker because we haven't had a, still don't have any access to PPE to allow people to come into the home. I've experienced so many microaggressions from delivery people that I was very much in a kind of, well, you know, it would just be much easier not to eat. It would be much easier to have a really restricted diet. And if I wasn't also sheltering Julie, my partner in our chair, then I think that would have been my instant response would have just been to look at what little I could eat and how narrow a diet I could eat just to get away from the microaggressions of people whether it's deliberately putting things on the wheelchair ramp deliberately putting food without packaging straight into the dirt you know it's almost as soon as they see the disabled signs wow. you know it starts and I think all of those things really really pressure it 
But I wonder how it impacts on the way we're treated as artists. There's been a campaign for quite a long time now, relatively speaking, to pay artists to exhibit. And I have to say, we do pay artists to exhibit here. But in publicly funded galleries, and yes, actually, I think we always have paid our artists, but most publicly funded galleries, you come in to exhibit and you do not get a penny. And if you're not a selling artist, and a lot of people don't want to sell their work, they want to retain it to be able to tour and to do everything else, there's no way of making any kind of income from that. You know, often galleries work, the paid staff are paid because the artists come in and rent the galleries for selling shows. And of course, they've got to pay whether they sell or not. I mean, you've been traveling around the world doing your different studies and your research how have you found that is pretty much the case everywhere is it more common perhaps in the UK and US I think it's honestly a global issue within the art world I think we live in a capitalist society so everyone's trying to make a quick dollar and they see art as something that's more of a leisure and more of a money maker and I think that as an artist, I've faced so much adversary in trying to get my art out there because it's submission fees or it's, oh, we want to make a publication. So we're going to charge you, the artist, on top of the time and the effort and the supplies and the materials and the research that you put into it to make the actual artwork. You're like, yes, we want to charge you more. But in retrospect, it's not beneficial to creating a positive art environment. In fact, it deters many people from actually going into art and it makes the production of art just at a reduced quality because it's not promoting those who are already this fortunate or have a disadvantaged situation from accessing these resources. So yes, I mean, I think in terms of performing artists, the average UK artist earned less than £10,000 and that was in 2019. You know, it's because we'd already, I think, before COVID, had great fears about the universal credit system coming in, replacing the tax credit system, and artists just being designated by the inland revenue as fail failing businesses, that if you can't make at least £12,000 a year in profit, which means you're in the income tax bracket, they just don't see it as sustainable. But in the meantime, curators and funders are quite happily sitting around going, oh, well, all artists starve, you know, it's, it's and it, there's always that myth, isn't there, that somehow it's necessary. You've got to suffer for your art. Whereas in my experience, you can't make work if you're really suffering. You know, if you're all you're bothered about is how you're going to keep the electricity on or pay for your phone or whether the bailiffs are going to come around, you know, all of which I've experienced. You don't feel very creative, but it's an excuse for everybody else, isn't it? Oh, starving artist, starving artist, darling. Yeah, it's, it's honestly ignoring the fact that there's a difference between survival mode and then just honing into your, I think, yourself and your struggles. And I think that there's just such a big divide between what the, I think the external art world and the art world that is focused on art sales and art, I think, publicity and art fame, rather than focusing on what artists go through to make the art. And I think that there's such a big lack of that in our contemporary conversation. I've seen so many people charge an enormous amount of money for a residence fee, and then they expect you to run their gallery for free. And it's just, it's, I think it's disrespectful to artists. And as human beings, we shouldn't be doing that to each other, trying to make money off of people who are already struggling to make a reputation for themselves. I mean, unless you're doing another job, so I work as artistic director for Together 2012 part time, there's no such thing as a salary for an artist, or at least not in the UK, because places like Finland and France for certain types of arts do have different systems. And, you know, there are countries where you can be under government contract as a freelance, but I don't think I'm ever likely to live in one of those countries. It, the more I think about it, the more I think it's extraordinary that we as the public, as well as the private sector, are funding all of these people with sick pay and pensions and holiday pay and career structure. And the artists will come in and they might exhibit their work and not be paid. They might exhibit their work and, like you say, pay themselves. 
I think one of the things that really struck me, and this is going back to 2018, I met two artists who I knew less than a week apart, and they'd both been apparently very substantially funded under a public scheme and had very, very high profile work, you know, not just in the UK, but shown overseas. One of them was literally starving and the other had just retrained for another profession so she could do that alongside being an artist. And these were international artists with international reputations and work, like I say, that had been very well funded. And the one who was literally starving said to me, well, of course, I didn't get any of the money. And I couldn't quite take that in. And then it was very much, again, classic. Well, you're a disabled artist, you're on benefit because you can't afford to not be on benefits. And then they go, oh, we don't want to mess up your benefits. Well, to me, any funded scheme there to support artists should be making artists fit for work, you know, in the real sense. There's all sorts of benefits you can get in work. But the idea that somebody, in order to come to London, where I met her, you know, as it, not to meet me, I have to say, but, you know, I met her when she happened to be in London. And that had taken all the money that she would have had for food. And again, this idea that very often, in fact, the funding for disabled artists is really just going to non-disabled people. You know, the, the people working alongside them, the director, the producer, the stage manager, the front of house, very often in these funded schemes, none of those people are disabled. And yet the disabled artist is not getting the bulk of the money. And that, I think, again, it comes down to we have to eat. Yeah. It's not an optional extra. The eating disorders kick in. And certainly for me, you know, I think in retrospect, I'd always had a very disordered, dysfunctional, you know, relationship with food. But it only became a problem when I was literally starving anyway. I was, you know, food poor. We didn't have food banks around the late 90s. So it kicks it all off. And I think that sort of stress of knowing you can't afford to buy food or nice food, you know, again, something I'm finding with a sort of, at the moment, thankfully, somebody's been kind enough to go and drag home a click and collect shop. But we're just doing that once a fortnight. And again, you know, you go for the days where you haven't actually got anything particularly appetizing left. And if you don't feel hungry and there's not something nice to eat, yeah. And of course, lots of people are eating kind of really horrible, very, very basic, repetitive menus. All of that feeds the eating disorder, doesn't it? You know, and yet when we see things, your show, I think, is the first first thing I've seen that says we're not the problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as all disabled people would say, you know, we are what we are. You know, human beings are a very complex mix of strengths and weaknesses. They vary hugely over a lifetime and often over the course of a day. But it's always seen as somehow this is coming from internal. It's not about the lack of income. It's not about the lack of available food. It's not about the kind of expectation that you will starve because you will be an artist. Somehow it's a deficiency in the person living with the eating disorder, but that's incredibly convenient for everybody else, isn't it? Yeah, I absolutely think there's also a scarcity mindset, especially in COVID when you're not sure when you're gonna get your next meal, you're not sure when your next paycheck is gonna come in. You might as well just go for the cheaper option or get something you can get in bulk because you know that it's something that will keep you full and it'll keep you going. And it's not a time right now or for people with eating disorders to ever treat themselves or ever give that body the compassion it really needs when it's a very difficult time like this. So I think that it's just such a tough situation. I think not only like disabled people, but just people in general are just struggling to even put meals on their, like on their tables for their families. And so this has just been challenging for everyone. And I, I hate to admit that there's going to be people that are going to struggle even more because of the current pandemic yes I mean we've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds 
queued up outside of just one food bank in Newham, you know, and it's going to be a very difficult winter, which is the other reason that I thought this exhibition was so relevant, not just to us as an organisation, but also to East London. Shall we have another picture up? Yeah, yeah. So we'll wait to see what appears. Oh, good. So tell us about this series. So this series is called Sometimes Memories Never Leave Your Bones. And it's a series of six works and they all depict um, myself with my childhood teddy bear. Her name is Pink. And it's trying to explore the refuge and the safety you find with an eating disorder. I think a lot of it relates to wherever the source of an eating disorder comes from, whether hereditary or because of external causes or just something that's manifest, you kind of seek refuge in it. And I use my bear as a metaphor for safety and comfort. And she's been with me for everything. So I kind of see that innocence in childhood adolescence versus the traumatic body and the traumatic changes and the difficulties within the eating disorder. So they're trying to juxtapose each other and trying to fight, but also trying to like find that compassion that you really need during this time in your life. So, yeah. I think it is such a powerful symbol. I mean, as it happens, we've been running teddy bear things on together unlocked the live stream that we run on a monday wednesday and friday from 3 to 4 p.m so on a wednesday we have a sort of comedy clockwork paralympics and then one of our teddy bears wears a medal and it's simply because as part of lockdown one and continuing there's this international bear hunt based around the children's <laughs> books where people look out for for teddy bears in windows as they're going for walks but also on live streams and on tvs and it reminded me of my pink teddy which was my childhood teddy bear who came on to compete in the clockwork paralympics and everybody was very rude about in terms of being scruffy and dirty but i thought just loved but it really i think very deliberately perhaps ties back into with that stereotype of people with eating disorders as not wanting to grow up and not wanting to be women which I don't think is true I think it's much more complex than that I think for myself it has a bit to do with that a part of it is trying to revert to a sense of not innocence but a sense of safety and when you're a child you felt safe you felt that like food didn't harm you at least for me I found like it was something that brought me joy and as you get older you realize that your body sometimes is not your friend and it tries to fight you and I think that when I grew up I became more feminine going through puberty and I wasn't happy with it I didn't want my hips to protrude I didn't want to go through my monthly period I felt like my body was trying to hate me and I was like what did I do to deserve this so I think if you're too skinny and too bony to have your period then you're kind of defying your gender and you're trying to seek a little bit of control in a world where you can't have much control yeah I mean I think the only thing I would say is yes I completely agree with you I would just say that's actually very complex and I think it's often I think from outside, people can see it as, as perhaps simpler. I think that the image of the teddy and the image of the childhood is also very important because we're kind of encouraged to have a false division. Julie was laughing, I think, last week because we were saying, oh, we had a lot more teddy bears in the house than the surgeoners, and the surgeoners had a house full of medals. <laughs> and... Um, but I like the fact that I've got a studio full of clockwork toys and sitting around the steps is a whole bunch of teddy bears because I think that kind of being able to celebrate the child within, but also look after the child exactly. who's still within us. And there's something, yeah, there's something very, very powerful and very, very beautiful about these pictures. And you can really... Yeah, you, you just take an awful lot of emotion from it. Again, I'm blown away by the fact that these are actually six inch by four inch because they're clearly images that can also work larger than life, you know, which is the impression you get 
when you're going around the virtual exhibition, isn't it? Yeah, I think there's another one that um, I think the next image would give another good representation of that. Which one do you um, want, Ali? I think it's worshipping the porcelain throne. Yep. Can you see that? I can't. <laughs> we can't yet. We've, oh, there we go. No, oh. we did have it. I think <laughs> it's just gonna take a little bit of time to come through. So let's try it again. And then yeah. we'll just give it a few minutes to load. While Josh is doing that, oh, brilliant, it's up. So this is um, a series of four paintings and it's called Worshipping the Porcelain Throne. It depicts myself um, binging and purging on a toilet seat. And these ones are massive on the on the website. It's um, they take up the full wall, and it's a sequence of the experience of purging. the um, The message behind it is really the repetition, but also the strain and the mental anguish that you go through within the eating disorder experience. Again, in popular culture, they say, and they joke about it. Oh, just go um, vomit up your food. And just like, if you have food poisoning, just like, just get rid of it. You know, it's something that it's seen as an antidote, but rather it's, it's a torment. And it's something that isn't pleasant. It makes you uncomfortable. It makes you realize how much you're struggling. And the fact that it hurts you to do this almost every single time that you're eating and the idea that food can't be your friend is something that I really want to explore in these pieces and it's a very intimate set of portraits and it's something that you feel so isolated when you're doing the act because no one should know and no one talks about this but really it's something that far more people do than they want to admit. I mean, I think that's just so beautifully put. I love, well, perhaps that's the wrong word, but the, the final one, there's, you know, almost something about Munch and the scream coming through as she's looking through the fingers. And it's, it's the only one where you get a sense of looking out, isn't it? Yeah. But I think again, when, you know, as you say, you go into popular culture and particularly teenage girls films and magazines and yes yeah, so oh it's just this tiny little thing that somebody's been sick and yet yeah, we all know if we feel sick being sick is horrible but it is just dismissed and normalized and and then it's very hard for people to say I'm struggling I need help yeah so um, shall we move on because I wanted to make sure we had the piece where you have the reflection in the mirror I'm sure it's no secret to anybody to realise I'm absolutely dreadful on titles and names. <laughs> but um, are you able to find that picture, Josh? Is that? Yes, that's Ellie? it, isn't it, Ali? Yeah. So this one's um, from the bathtub series. It's... Um, for those of you who um, can't see it as well, it's a picture of a bathtub, but you're only seeing the reflection of the faucet and the dial to turn on the heat. You can see a brief little self-portrait in the reflection of the faucet, but you don't really see much. And this piece was one that I made um, briefly after a really tough time of my life with the eating disorder. I think it was something that I started to lose my identity a bit to the eating disorder. And I think when you're in a shower and you kind of have that time to have those shower thoughts and you kind of really reflect on who you are and why you're feeling this way, but then also the heat and the comfort coming down from the water and you're feeling it on your body it was very like meditative. In this piece, I kind of want to show the thing that isn't really shown, which is 
the self-portrait in it. And it's a little reminiscent of one of my favorite artists, Jan van Nyck and the Norfolk portrait. But it's something that I realize your body is something you don't have an experience of seeing. Instead, you only see fragments and you only see a disordered perception of what it is. And I've constantly told my partners, like, I need to see somebody who's exactly my height, exactly my weight, just so I know what I actually look like, right? Because you don't realize what you're feeling and what you're seeing versus what you're actually living as. So this is kind of a representation of all those crazy and hectic thoughts of just not knowing who you are. I think that's so clever. One of the things that I think, yeah, I think we've really taken as hosts of Unlocked on board that issue that we perceive ourselves as the mirror image of who we really are. So when you see yourself on screen for the first time, you keep going in the wrong direction because you think, oh, I need to move one way, but actually you move in completely the opposite direction. And you look at yourself and you think, you know, I don't look like that. I look like a mirror image because you always see the mirror image. And yet very few of us have got symmetrical faces. Yeah. I also think that this is a great piece to show the non-traditional approach to representation of eating disorders is most of the time, as even in my own work, it's very apparent that scales and food are the direct way people associate it with an eating disorder but I think this one kind of sheds a different light on what the eating disorder experience can be shown as and what it can be affecting more than just your typical meals and exercising in your daily life but rather it's something that exists with you all of the time no matter whether you're in front of a meal or in a gym. And I think it's about visibility. I mean, as I was saying earlier, people with eating disorders haven't been visible either in the disabled people's movement or the disability arts movement. And yet anybody living with an eating disorder long term, it's like any other health condition. And I think it is that kind of idea that we should be ashamed, which as disabled people, we say, well, whatever impairment we have, we're proud. You know, we're proud to be here. It's just part of the human condition. But yes, I think the visibility that this show has, we're coming towards the end. So I'm just wondering, are there any images we were going to look at tonight that haven't been shown? I believe there's one, but I'm also open if anyone has any questions or comments so far. <laughs> I haven't seen any questions come up, but we do have live chat for anybody who's on the panel. So I can also discuss so it if anyone wants to type in or if not. <laughs> So we're, we're just waiting to see if Josh is able to find the last image. What does it look like, Ali? Um, it's a girl. She's in a, a, like a blank room and she's almost floating with her face covered. It's called Get Me Out. I don't believe... I'm not convinced that we've one. seen that one, actually. So that, but that's a good thing, really, because it, I will just encourage people to have a look at it in the exhibition. So the way you see the exhibition is you go to the website, um, www.together2012.org.uk, click on the Ali Z exhibition, and then you'll get a whole page up that includes an interview with Ali from Unlocked with Hazel Brill. It will include this interview. Well, it will include this embedded in it. But critically, you can just click straight through to the gallery. So this is from Renee Wallen, who says your artwork is incredible. Thank you for sharing. I'd love to share a screenshot from this interview. Will that be OK? Yeah, it's fine by me. <laughs> so she's saying that would be fine. And Rene also says the most interesting event I've seen from ages. And P. Hillier says, this was really interesting to see from a first person perspective. My sister lived with bulimia for many years and I never really understood. So thank you for enlightening me. And again, I think it's because we never hear from ourselves do we we hear from the so-called experts but of course as disabled people we would always say well we're the we're the only experts 
on our lived experience. So just in the couple of minutes that we've got left, Josh has also put up a direct link on live chat to anybody who's joined us by Zoom. But if you're watching on YouTube or you're watching this on the website, either live or recorded, then that link will remain up. Everything we do, we archive. We think it is so important to our history as disabled people, to our art history. So you will be able to come back and watch this again in the future. So just in the last minute, Ali, you told us a little bit about what you're doing at the moment, but what's coming up immediately next for you? Next for me is um, presenting the, um, the starving artists in another artist residency coming up in Glasgow. And other than that, I've been working on turning these artworks into a publication. So hopefully that will be coming out within the next year. So I'm looking forward to it. And thank you guys so much for attending this event. And it's really important to get this conversation started. And I'm really glad to have this platform. So thank you as well together. It's been really nice being here. Well, it's just been great to have you. So also on the event page, we have Ali's website. We have the current publication details. So do continue to follow Ali. I know we will be and hope to see more of Ali again in the future. And who knows if you book to come to our end of festival party you may see Ali and all sorts of other artists there as well but at this moment it's exactly eight o'clock so I'm going to say thank you so much to Global Real Time Captioning who've done the captions thank you to Chris Burrow who's our BSL interpreter thank you to Josh Josh Surgener, who's been pushing all the buttons, to Robin Surgener, who welcomed you all in and managed to talk for half an hour. Next time we're going to get him a glass of water, you know, no expense spared. We've got some more wonderful things coming up. Next will be Thursday night, at live art night, back here at seven o'clock. We'd love to see you then. As always, you can book to join in by Zoom or simply watch us on YouTube or the website. So thank you all very much for coming. And on that happy note, Josh, you can push the final button and the curtain 